the the next uh, uh, series of concepts that we're going to be looking at actually goes over the course of two units of study, two units of study, and we're going to be looking at uh, uh, energy production in animals. Now, energy production is probably one of the most important biological and biochemical processes known, and uh, even though we're using this or we're looking at this over two units of study, we're still only really scratching the surface. So ultimately, the way this is going to, to work, because uh, we find that there are two processes at work uh, simultaneously within animal systems at any given time to produce energy. Uh, these two, pr two uh, processes are going to be uh, 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 sort of delineated when, uh, you know, going through uh, the, the next two units of study. So let's take, uh, take a look at these and see how, uh, how they're going to be uh, uh, set apart and differentiated. The current unit, unit 12, that we're getting into, um, there is an energy production pathway, but, uh, but there's some salient features of that that, that that we need to talk about. We'll go into that in a little more uh, in detail as we move along. The first is that uh, it, the, the first unit, or rather the first uh, biological process towards energy production is anaerobic. And we'll, ultimately that means it occurs in the absence of molecular oxygen. O2. Now, that, that's really meaningless unless we look at the, the next one, which we'll talk about, uh, which does require a, uh, the, the, the presence of uh, molecular oxygen in order to, uh, to move forward. Uh, importantly, uh, this uh, unit 12 process, this first uh, energy production pathway, produces relatively little energy. And I say relatively little because that's compared to the, the, uh, the next energy production pathway, which we'll look at, which by comparison produces a lot of energy. What energy means? What, what does it mean to produce energy and what form is it in? Well, we have to, uh, we're going to get to that and, and, uh, and, and that uh, type of energy that we're talking about uh, will be the same throughout these next two units of study. So uh, that will be the current unit that we're going to start working on uh, this week. Um, and probably by the end of the week or into next week, we'll get into our next unit of study, which is another energy production pathway, uh, which uh, is uh, an aerobic process, an, an aerobic process. It requires oxygen. It requires molecular oxygen in order to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to, to move forward. Um, by comparison with the, the first uh, energy production pathway, it produces a lot of energy a lot of energy by comparison so that uh, so we'll, we'll see the difference and it's actually quite profound the difference in energy uh, that that one process or unit 13 process uh, uh, produces over over the other one so we're going to start our foray into energy production pathways looking at this first uh, this first pathway um, and that is going to be termed as anaerobic energy production so now it's time to discuss what we mean by energy. When we think of energy, that can take many forms. As we know, uh, energy uh, there's different types of energy, heat energy, electrical energy, uh, energy of motion, kinetic energy, and they can all be interconverted into one another. Uh, they just can't, they just cannot be created or it cannot be destroyed. Um, so the energy that we're talking about uh, is, is going to be chemical energy uh, within animal systems. Chemical energy, which is energy that is contained within uh, uh, a chemical bond structure. We sort of looked at that at the beginning of, of general chemistry. And in order to, uh, uh, when we produce energy, it's, uh, it's important that we, energy has to be used at the moment of production or it has to be stored and uh, an analogy that we can look at in this case would be uh, if we have a storage of energy um, from our everyday life might be a battery um, we could store energy within a battery we can put a battery into a device that requires uh, electrical energy and and that device works just fine through that storage of energy well, it turns out that in biological systems, in animal systems, we have our own battery. Uh, and that is, uh, is a molecule known as uh, uh, ATP. Again, ATP is an acronym uh, which uh, ultimately means uh, or stands for adenosine triphosphate. 
adenosine triphosphate, um, ATP, we, uh, we, we, uh, we abbreviate that as. Um, if we look very closely at this, we find that ATP is of nucleotide structure. Nature, we find when it, when it set, settles on something or a, a type of molecular structure that it likes, it tends to uh, use it over and over. We just got out of a whole unit of study which used the nucleotide as the basis for, uh, for information storage. Uh, when we're talking about DNA and genetic material. And now we have a nucleotide structure, and this is a nucleotide structure. Over here we have a nitrogenous base, and uh, in this case adenine. Here we have a structural sugar, in this case ribose. And here we have a phosphate group. Indeed, we have a lot of different phosphate groups here. So that, uh, so that this is indeed nucleotide structure. Um, so here, you know, uh, again, uh, adenine, ribose, and phosphate groups comes out to uh, uh, adenosine triphosphate. And we'll take a look at a little bit more closely at some of the way these, uh, these, these uh, covalent bond structures are put together. Now, if we look at uh, the, the, stru the, the structure of this molecule, this ATP, we find that we, what the real business end here are these three phosphate groups that are attached in series. Um, notice that if, if we look at this structure, if we were talking about a, a nomenclature, if we looked at this part right here, that would be considered adenosine. So we have adenine and ribose together make for adenosine. So adenosine uh, is, is the, the fusion of, uh, of, of uh, adenine and ribose, and ultimately uh, the difference is the number of phosphates that are attached. If uh, So the normal uh, uh, nucleotide structure has one phosphate attached, so this would be a standard nucleotide right here, but we also have other phosphates, either another one more or two more uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, connected together by very special and particular covalent bonds. Now, let's look uh, very importantly here. Um, these, these bonds right here, these phosphoanhydride bonds. And remember, we looked at an acid anhydride way back in unit five. That was two carbonyls, which were sort of flanked in the middle with an oxygen. This is a, called a phosphoanhydride bond because instead of C double bond O, we have a couple of P double bond O's, which are flanking an oxygen right in the middle here, so that this would be considered a phosphoanhydride bond. And when we looked at these uh, phosphoester or phosphoanhydride uh, types of bonds, they're really considered uh, high energy bonds high energy. We actually store chemical energy within these bonds, and they're given here as these squiggles. So they're not, now a covalent bond does not look like a squiggle, uh, but they're just uh, representing it here as a squiggle because it means this covalent bond has a lot of energy contained within it, a lot of energy. And uh, uh, contrary to the way most uh, chemical bonds work, if we're to break this squiggle bond, this phosphoanhydride bond, it releases energy, just like a battery. So that uh, we find we have a way of holding a lot of energy within a couple of, uh, a, a, a very, very high energy uh, covalent bonds. So it's these second and third phosphate groups that are the, the basis of ATP energy production, energy storage, and energy release. When, uh, so here we have a phosphoanhydride bond. This is the one over on the end, the one that's going to be breaking and releasing energy for the energy production pathways that we are talking about, this battery, this ATP molecule. It is this end phosphoanhydride bond that uh, ultimately breaks and releases energy for chemical processes which, uh, which require it. There is this other uh, internal phosphoanhydride bond and it breaks sometimes to give energy for other processes, but we're not going to be specifically talking about that one. It really is the phosphoanhydride bond, uh, anhydride bond on the end which, uh, which breaks to give uh, to, to release, rather, energy for uh, all cellular needs. So let's back off just a little bit from the 
chemical structure that we saw, or the organic structure of ATP, and we'll look at it more of in a, a cartoon sense. And let's look at how this energy release from this molecular battery actually takes place. So here is a representation of ATP, a very re general representation, but with much less detail than we saw before, but we can understand it. Here is our uh, uh, our nitrogenous base, here is our structural sugar, and these three P's right here are our three phosphates, adenosine triphosphate. So we're, we're looking at it in that manner. Now, uh, uh, this is ATP, and when we have a process which requires the release of energy from this molecular battery, that's what's given right here uh, on this arrow, we need to release this energy. How that ultimately occurs is uh, through the breaking of one of these phosphoanhydride bonds uh, right here. So these one of the, that end bond releases, and we release energy. So, and but what is the res what are the results of that broken uh, phosphoanhydride bond? Well, let's look over here on the product profile. Now we get. Uh, as opposed to adenosine triphosphate, that T in ATP was for one, two, three phosphates, we end up with adenosine diphosphate. That's changed to ADP. Why? Because we have only one, two phosphates left. So this is a classic uh, representation of that energy release over and over again is, uh, if you will, this uh, ATP goes to a DP plus a phosphate. That is the, the what, what it looks like from the matter end of things. But what has happened is that we've broken that phosphoanhydride bond. And very importantly, it's this energy now that is produced uh, from the reaction that can then be, uh, that, that can then be used for cellular processes requiring that. Now, when this conversion happens, ATP to ADP, it does not mean that this, uh, this product profile, this ADP uh, right here, is rendered useless now and then can be just deconstructed atom by atom within, uh, within the body. This is actually a back and forth process. Remember, ATP is the charged battery. We find now that ADP is the spent battery. The spent battery. So rather than looking at this like uh, this, uh, the ATP is a battery. We now can uh, augment that to uh, to to say that ATP is a rechargeable battery. A ATP to ADP. This process right here is uh, discharging the entire battery. So ADP is our dead battery. However, we find that through uh, extracting energy from fuel molecules we take in in our diet, we, we can take that energy and stitch ADP to back together to form ATP. So, so what can this rechargeable battery now, we can take our dead battery and a phosphate and using energy that we extract from fuel molecules in our diet, that would be this exact same energy right here, we can stitch them back together to form ATP. And that really is the process. Uh, this is why we, why, why we eat, why we have dietary intake of, uh, of, of organic molecules. These are considered fuel, like filling your tank up, your car tank up with gas. The, the, the food we eat is our fuel, and that the, and the chemical energy extracted from those fuel molecules is used to uh, convert our spent battery, ADP, back to ATP. What exactly does that mean? It means we have enough energy here now in our diet, let me clean this up a little bit here, uh, to take this phosphate and attach it right on the very end of ADP again. That requires the same amount of energy that was spent when we broke it, the same amount of energy for uh, building it back together again to form this, uh, this now ATP molecule again. It's a way of, of storing that chemical energy which we extract from dietary fuel molecules in, a, in, uh, in trillions of batteries. And these batteries are uh, our ATP. Again, ATP being our charged battery 
ADP and phosphate being our discharged battery, but it's a rechargeable battery, so that's okay. Anytime we extract energy from fuel molecules from our diet, we can reform or recharge that battery. Let's look at uh, the chemistry which is happening here because it's, it's an, there's an important consideration here. When I take ADP and, uh, and covalently bind it to a phosphate, that is known as a phosphorylation event, a phosphorylation. Now, a, any uh, phosphorylate, any reaction really that happens within biological systems uh, virtually always is, is mediated by an enzyme. This event where we are phosphorylating ADP with a phosphate to form ATP is carried out by a special class of enzymes. You remember our six classes of enzymes that, that, we'd, uh, that, that we looked at back in the enzymes unit of study? Well, that we now have another class. Uh, so any enzyme or a class of enzyme which mediate phosphorylation events, which this is, is known as a kinase class of enzymes, kinase. So anytime we take a phosphate group and we covalently attach it to something, uh, we, uh, we end up with, uh, we're using a class of enzymes known as a kinase, and that'll be an important one to remember. So let's take a practical look about what I was talking about earlier, this idea of, uh, of, of harvesting energy from fuel molecules from our, our dietary intake uh, of, of food. Um, this ultimately is, uh, is collectively known as catabolism. When we catabolize, ultimately to catabolize means to degrade. So we're degrading uh, fuel molecules what that means from, uh, from, from the standpoint of biochemistry is that we are simplifying them. We're making them smaller. We're degrading them down into smaller and smaller carbon fragments. So catabolism is the degradation of fuel molecules to produce cellular energy. That energy once produced can be uh, used immediately for cellular processes, or we can store it in our rechargeable batteries uh, and, in, uh, and charge up some ATP. Now, importantly, there are three stages of catabolism. And uh, when I talk about fuel molecules, we really can talk about a number of different types of molecules. Uh, we'll be mainly talking about glucose overwhelmingly in these next two units of study. Glucose is the primary, primary energy molecule in animal systems. It is the go-to fuel molecule. There are others. Uh, we can extract, uh, certainly extract energy from, uh, from for, for instance, triglycerides from fats where, uh, through a similar but not identical process. Um, under certain conditions, namely starvation conditions, we can actually extract energy using uh, amino acids, but it, that requires breaking down of our, our proteins and muscle tissue in order to do that again that's typically under starvation conditions the by far the most uh, the most effective and used uh, fuel molecule is glucose so that's what we're going to be working with and the way that glucose enters our system most of the time uh, for use is through dietary starches so in our three st uh, stages of catabolism, the first stage is actually an energy intensive stage. That means it requires energy. It requires energy we already have. It's like an investment. If I invest this amount of energy in this process, my return on that investment is going to be more energy. So that's, all, that's the, uh, the ultimate trade-off. So this first uh, process does actually require energy. It does not produce any energy. And this is the hydrolysis of dietary starches. Now, hydrolysis, we're using water to cut these dietary starches like amylose and amylopectin are simply, uh, are simply polymers of glucose. And we have to hydrolyze those uh, glycosidic bonds, those uh, alpha-1,4 glycosidic bonds to uh, come up with our glucose monomers. Remember, we cannot access the energy within glucose uh, unless they are in their monomeric form. So that requires energy, the energy of digestion of these dietary starches so that we can actually have our fuel molecule which we can from which we can access energy, those glucose monomers. 
Now, the next two stages of catabolism are going to mirror the next two units of study, the unit of study we're in now and the unit of study to follow. The unit of study we're in now involves us uh, uh, exclusively the second stage of catabolism. That is the conversion of these glucose monomers. And let's remember now that glucose has six carbons in it. That's going to be important. Six carbons. We convert these six carbon glucose monomers into, we basically break them in half into three carbon fragments. These, are, these uh, three carbon molecules are known as pyruvate, um, which can be further oxidized later in the third stage of catabolism, the next unit of study. So we're uh, uh, exclusively looking here now at this, uh, at this second, uh, second stage of catabolism in this unit of study here, the conversion of glucose monomers into two three-carbon fragments of pyruvate, which can be further oxidized later. Now again, this would be considered a degradation of a fuel molecule because we are making it simpler. We're breaking it apart. One six-carbon glucose is being broken down into two three-carbon fragments. We've made it simpler. We've simplified it. We've degraded it. Now, uh, as promised before, this is an anaerobic process, an anaerobic process that occurs in the absence of oxygen. And uh, as promised in that first slide, it produces a mod moderate amount of energy. Now we know what that energy is. It is in the form of ATP. We charge up some rechargeable batteries from this process. And compared to the next uh, stage of catabolism, it produces a small amount of ATP in the process. What that really is, we'll, we'll, we'll tally up later, but it's much less ATP produced per uh, fuel molecule than the, uh, the third stage of catabolism. And that third stage of catabolism breaks down those three carbon uh, fragments of pyruvate into uh, uh, one carbon, carbon dioxide molecules. So this is the next unit of study we're going to be looking at, is that conversion of our three carbon pyruvate molecules into one carbon CO2s or carbon dioxides. This, as we said before, is an aerobic process. It requires molecular oxygen to be present. And compared with the second stage of catabolism, it produces large amounts of ATP in the process. So let's take a little bit of a closer look at this extraction of energy from fuel molecules. Essentially, no matter what the fuel molecule is, in our case, in the next two units of study, that's going to be glucose uh, uh, specifically, um, catabolism of fuel molecules means that the carbon atoms within that fuel molecule are continually being moved to a higher oxidation state. We've talked about oxidation and what that means in organic systems, essentially an increase in carbon oxygen bonds and a decrease in uh, carbon hydrogen bonds. So keep in mind that in order to be, if we are extracting energy from a fuel molecule, we are continually moving the carbons in that fuel molecule as we extract energy from them into a higher oxidation state. So let's see if we can actually count that. The, first of all, the process by which here, here in this unit of study, this anaerobic um, uh, type of energy extraction or energy production is known as glycolysis, glycolysis. And we're gonna be looking uh, very closely at what, uh, what the process, the chemical transformations of glycolysis, what that actually means. But let's, uh, let's, let's put this together. Gly what glycolysis does, as we uh, uh, put out there before, is we take one six-carbon uh, glucose molecule. Notice I have it as D-glucose, but I don't even mention that because it's always D. D uh, monosaccharides are the ones that are produced in nature. They're the only ones that are utilized in nature. L monosaccharides are not. So uh, we don't really have to leave that D onto D-glucose. But here is a, uh, a rendering of glucose, uh, which we see right here. And uh, if we counted all of the carbon oxygen bonds and all of the carbon hydrogen bonds, we would have seven of each, seven of each, seven CO bonds, seven CH bonds. Now, um, through glycolysis, we form two three carbon fragments of that molecule I told you about before, 
pyruvate molecules, two of them. And this is what a pyruvate molecule looks like. There's two of them right next to each other. Uh, we're going to get rather familiar with uh, the structure of pyruvate. But as you can see, each of them contain one, two, three carbon atoms. Uh, and so, so indeed, they are two, three carbon uh, 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 catabolic uh, uh, end products of this process. But let's, on both of these, we'll count the total number of car carbon oxygen bonds and carbon hydrogen bonds. And we find that in our product profile, we have 10 CO bonds and six CH bonds. We have increased in carbon oxygen bonds and decreased in carbon hydrogen bonds. By definition, that is the uh, that means oxidation has occurred. As we saw, uh, oxidation or the, the extraction of energy, this catabolism means we're we're bringing our fuel molecules to a higher oxidation state and that is indeed happening so this process must indeed re, uh, release some energy it must release some energy so uh, this energy let's take a look at that that energy is immediately used to uh, drive the formation of ATP remember what does it mean to drive formation of ATP it means we have an ADP my discharged rechargeable battery and a phosphate, which are then going to be covalently bound together by way of that, that very uh, energetic, strong uh, phosphoanhydride bond. That is the formation of ATP. Now, uh, again, so as the six carbons of glucose become progressively more oxidized, and we saw that right here, uh, it drives the formation of ATP. Uh, we our, our truism from before was that if uh, uh, if our carbons are being taken to a higher oxidation state, I must be releasing energy or extracting energy, and that extracted energy is immediately it immediately drives the formation of ATP. Let's take that energy and recharge our discharged rechargeable battery. So we're slowly going to uh, to bring or, or show uh, express the complexity of this process. Um, glycolysis, we said before, we had just showed that we had glucose over on the left hand side and a couple of pyruvate molecules on the right hand side, and ultimately uh, this produces some energy. So let's we're, let's make this a little bit more complex. We're going to increase our complexity. What glycolysis is, and yes, we are going to go, go through this in its entirety, is a series of 10 reactions. 10 reactions which convert one six carbon glucose molecule into two three carbon pyruvate molecules. Um, the process uh, of this, uh, these 10 reactions can essentially be broken down into two sets of five reactions. Now, the first five reactions are considered an energy investment stage. And the, on this uh, overview, it can be generally thought to go to about here. This is a halfway point on this process. And this is an energy investment stage. It uses up two ATP molecules. And here's that, here is that being represented here, ATP here, ATP here. They are being used up. They're being invested. And again, the idea of our energy investment is if I invest energy now, my return on that is going to be more energy, uh, my dividend that I get paid back. So let's see ultimately how that works. This process, uh, uh, the, the first five reactions of glycolysis given by the arrow on top, what it does is it splits six carbon glucose into two three carbon fragments, which will ultimately be uh, ended up will end up as uh, as two molecules of pyruvate. But it is in this next series of five reactions all the way to pyruvate, which uh, are the energy payoff stage, payoff stage. Let's see what that means. Well, whereas if you look over on the ATP uh, uh, investment, that was two ATP we invested into this process. That was the first five reactions, the energy investment stage. The uh, energy payoff stage, now remember we have two uh, parallel reactions. I have one, two, three, four ATP molecules produced in that process before we make it all the way 
to pyruvate. So we put in two, we invest two, we get back four. So that is, uh, that is a, a dividend, a return on our investment of a net two ATP per glucose molecule. We paid in two and we got back four. So that is, uh, that, that, that is a, a, an energy uh, uh, producing process and thus it is uh, energy positive. Now, if we look uh, closely here at this glycolysis overview, we see something sort of strange. We see this, N this in green here, these boxes says NADH. And what might that be? Well, uh, the, uh, NADH is, uh, is something that we've looked at before, a form of what, something we've looked at before. Uh, and we find that uh, the process of glycolysis uh, going from uh, glucose to pyruvate uh, makes this statement we reduce two NAD molecules to NADH, NAD to NADH. Now we've talked about NAD before. Notice NAD here has a little uh, a, a superscript positive on there. That's because the entire molecule has a net positive charge on it. We'll talk about that. But in glycolysis, we constantly are cycling NADH, or rather NAD, I'm sorry, to NADH, and I'm claiming that that is a reduction. A reduction typically uh, means an increase in carbon-hydrogen bonds. Well, let's look at uh, NAD and NADH from uh, 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 more closely from a molecular standpoint. NAD is an acronym for nicotine amide adenine dinucleotide. Uh, now, we had looked at uh, NAD as one of our cofactors, uh, really uh, our, our B complex of vitamins. It is, a, is a, it is a construct derived from vitamin B3, nicotine amide. And here it is up here. This is vitamin B3. And what the body does is it takes our, our, our vitamin B3 and it adds on a whole lot of other stuff. And this is the, uh, the other stuff that is uh, added onto it. And uh, th that is, uh, and the end result of that is a cofactor. One of our cofactors in our energy production pathways, which I sort of uh, laid the foundation for at the end of the enzymes chapter that this was a co small molecule cofactor. Yeah, small molecule, it's a little, seems a little, you know, larger than that, than that, but in any event, it's one of our small molecules which acts as a cofactor in these enzyme-mediated reactions which produce energy. So here we finally are with that. NAD, look at this positive char, this, this, this plus right there on NAD. Well, if you look, there is a positive charge right there on that nitrogen. There's four bond, four covalent bonds around it. So that puts a, a net positive charge on the entire molecule, and thus it is given as NAD+. Plus. You don't say the plus, you just say NAD. Now, I am, uh, I, I am submitting to you that NAD is in its oxidized form, in its oxidized form. So that by reducing it, we would have to, and what we will see is happening is we're going to increase uh, the number of CH bonds. So let's look at that. When we uh, reduce NAD, we go to something known as NADH. This is the reduced form of NAD. And if you look at these two, the, the top parts of both NAD and NADH, here we have one CH bond. Here, over on the right-hand side, we have two CH bonds. We have indeed increased the number of carbon-hydrogen bonds, so that is by definition a reduction, a reduction. Fair enough. So let's uh, talk about where that extra CH bond came from. The process of catabolism of fuel molecules results in really uh, the, the, uh, the production of what are called hydride ions, hydride ions. In glycolysis, this is, uh, th this is, is not a good thing, ultimately. Glycolysis is not a good thing, and uh, ultimately we have to do something with it. Let's talk about what a hydride ion is. H-Y-D-R, hydro, that means hydrogen. So we have a hydrogen with an extra electron. Normally a hydrogen atom has one proton and one electron, and that is a neutral hydrogen atom. 
If we pick up one more electron, that's two of them on hydrogen, that would make it H minus. And that is what is given, uh, that is what is known as a hydride, something very strange that we've never seen before. H minus, given here, there's a little negative charge there and the two dots on it signify the two electrons that this hydride ion has. In glycolysis, that is a waste product. And thus, that waste product has to be shuttled away. Now, the, the shuttle which takes away this hydride ion, this H minus, is NAD. So what NAD uh, does at this carbon here on NAD is it picks up a hydride, H minus. And we've added that over on the right-hand side here. If we look very closely now, we've added a CH bond. What that means is we've added a hydrogen and it's two electrons, because in a covalent bond, we have two electrons. That is a hydride ion. So this is our shuttle right here. NAD becomes the reduced form, which is given as NADH. We added an H to it, so they call it NADH. So uh, we, pick, we're, we pick up where you, we use NAD to pick up that hydride ion from glycolysis in order to allow glycolysis to continue. Somebody has to clean up the trash, in this case, it's hydride ions, and the, tr the, the garbage truck, if you will, is our NAD. Okay, here comes a garbage truck. We'll pick up that hydride ion and become NADH. And we can allow now glycolysis to continue. So that's basically what, what has been said here by this bullet point down on the bottom. Glycolysis produces per one, for every uh, molecule of glucose, two hydride ions, two of them as waste products. And they have to be shuttled away by NAD to form NADH. Once uh, we're going to find that, uh, that NAD, at, at least in, in, at the end of this unit of study and into the next one, that NADH, once formed, is not, uh, is, is, uh, is not useless. It does not just degrade into carbon atoms and nitrogen atoms and oxygen atoms and so on. It's very similar uh, from going from ATP to ADP and a phosphate. Well, Remember that ADP and a phosphate can be stitched back together to form ATP. The same sort of thing is done with our reduced NADH over here. That can be cycled back, giving up a hydride ion, back to NAD. Well, if the forward process was a reduction, the reverse process, we've learned this before, must be considered an oxidation, and indeed it is two CH bonds goes down to one CH bond. Yes, that is diagnostic for an oxidation. So since this is actually a chemistry course, we are going to follow each of the 10 reactions of glycolysis uh, uh, bit by bit to see, look at reactant profile versus product profile and, uh, and, and, and what sort of enzymes, uh, importantly, mediate those processes. So uh, we'll take a, a, a first look at the first five reactions of glycolysis. We call this our energy investment stage. And on that previous slide or the two previous slides ago, we uh, generally found that that was the first five reactions. It required the, the burning, if you will, or using up of two ATP molecules. So uh, note in this series of reactions, what I'm gonna be showing you is we have a starting material and we have a product profile. And on each successive reaction, this product will then appear as the starting material in the, in the next uh, uh, reaction, and that will go to its own product, and, uh, and so on and so forth. So we'll see, you'll, see uh, you'll be able to follow this in that manner. The first thing we have to do is we start with glucose, and we have to make glucose uncomfortable. We have to make it uncomfortable. And typically the way we do that is we're going to phosphorylate 
glucose. Look, we're phosphorylating glucose. And let's see what happens here. Phosphorylation, if you remember, has those high energy bonds associated uh, with them, those, those, uh, those uh, phosphoester bonds. Anything that is high energy means it's destabilizing. It is not stabilizing. So we're moving glucose to a higher and higher level of discomfort, if you could put a human term to it. So here now, we, we have uh, ATP, which has an extra phosphate to give away, uh, and glucose. And we take one of the, uh, ATP gives up one of its phosphates and uh, perches it, covalently bonds it on this oxygen right here to uh, phosphorylate, there it is, that's a phosphate group on that oxygen, uh, to, uh, our glucose to become what's called glucose 6-phosphate. Notice ATP gives up a phosphate and a bunch of energy to become ADP. Where did that energy go? That energy went into phosphorylating glucose and making it more unstable. So let's see what ultimately that means to make glucose more unstable. My next reaction is going to take, is going to start with glucose 6 phosphate and what that uh, what, what happens there is we is that we have taken our glucose 6 phosphate and we have uh, made it just uncomfortable enough so that it will isomerize at will so glucose 6 phosphate isomerizes to fructose 6 phosphate again we have this isomerization going on. Look at the enzyme here. It is, has the term isomerase right in the name. That as a class of enzymes, we could ask what class of enzyme uh, uh, mediates this reaction. Well, it's an isomerase because we're making a constitutional isomer going from reactant to product. On the previous slide, well, what did we do to glucose? We phosphorylated it. Oh, that must have been a kinase mediated uh, reaction because remember that new class of enzymes or kinase class of enzymes uh, what they do is they mediate phosphorylation events so we've made glucose just uncomfortable enough to form uh, glucose 6 phosphate and then let's see what goes on with I'm sorry fructose 6 phosphate and then let's see what happens after that fructose 6 phosphate uh, what ultimately goes on here now is another, our second ATP that we ha are uh, investing in this. We uh, have ATP here and it gives up yet another phosphate. It phosphorylates this oxygen right here to become ADP. So now let's look at uh, our, our, our products here. Uh, on the one side, on the reactant side, we have a single phosphorylated uh, uh, glucose isomer. And now we have a double phosphorylated uh, uh, isomer, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Not really important that you remember the name on that, but that this molecule is supremely unstable. It is very, very unstable. Uh, we have not one, but two phosphates attached to it with their attendant high energy phosphoester bonds. This is a very uncomfortable molecule. And what this sets it up uh, to do is it uh, goes from its cyclic form into its, uh, it, its linear form, uh, which we have right here on the left, and essentially it blows it in two. It takes a one six carbon fragment and blows it into two three carbon fragments, which we see right here. Um, that's the end result of, of making glucose as uncomfortable as it, as it can be through an enzyme mediated event, it breaks it in half, it blows it apart in two. And that is where, remember originally that arrow diverged into two processes. Um, uh, but let's look at our product profile here. We have our glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and what's called dihydroxyacetone phosphate. Now, in order to, for, this, uh, for this process to continue in a parallel fashion, because now we're talking about two three-carbon fragments, we have, uh, we have to, it must start with glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So a final reaction in this energy investment stage is a conversion of this molecule of dihydroxyacetone phosphate into 
glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So that's sort of almost an afterthought, if you will. And that's indeed what happens to form two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. You would notice that uh, our, uh, our starting material in our product, if you counted up all of the atoms uh, uh, within them, these are constitutional isomers of each other. Again, look at, the look at the enzyme which mediates this. It's an isomerase enzyme, and thus that makes sense because we're forming a constitutional isomer. So right now, let's see where we are. We're at the end of our first five reactions of glycolysis, the energy investment stage, where we've already burned two ATP for that one molecule of glucose, and we have not one, this is important, but two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So now we've entered into the second five reactions of glycolysis. As we said before, the second five reactions of the 10 are considered an energy payoff stage. Energy payoff, this is where we get the return on our investment in energy. And always when we're talking about energy, we're talking about ATP production. Um, and I want to uh, carefully note here that uh, for each reaction I'm showing, for instance, this first uh, first reaction, or rather the sixth in the ten uh, in the ten uh, reaction process, there is another reaction occurring right with it, but I'm just not showing it. So in your mind, when we go through these reactions, double it. So every time we produce an ATP, that's actually two ATP. Every time we produce an NADH from NAD, that is two of them. So just, just to put that out there, I'm not going to show them both side by side, but that's ultimately uh, what we're thinking when we do this. So remember, we, we ended the first five reactions at energy uh, investment stage with glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, two of them, and we're going to follow one of them. Now let's look at what happens here. We have an NAD goes to NADH. So we have this process right here. We had said before that this process must is considered a reduction. Remember, a, a, that was a reduction because we picked up a hydride ion. Well, that must mean this process is an oxidation. It has to be. You cannot have a reduction without a concurrent oxidation and vice versa. So our top piece right here, this must be an oxidation. We can infer that because NAD to NADH was a reduction. So let's see if we can structurally uh, inspect that to, to see whether uh, this uh, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate going to 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate is in fact an oxidation. Well, on, over here, I see an aldehyde functional group, and an aldehyde has two CO bonds, one CH bond. Well, look at what we have over here. We have lost in its CH bond. We have no CH bonds, but we have one, two, three CO bonds. By definition, that is, uh, that is an oxidation. So therefore, we, we can very easily make that, uh, make, make that connection. Again, this is the step, again, doubled, is the step where we produce NADH from NAD in this reaction. We produce that hydride, and that means that we have to have this garbage truck, NAD, come along, pick up that hydride, and shuttle it away as NADH. But I will mention that in so doing, we bring down our store of NAD because it now it is NADH. So we have to eventually we're going to have to take stock of that. Okay, so we are so we'll, in our in our next reaction we will look at our uh, what is the product here that will be the starting material in the next reaction and let's see how that works. 1,3 bisphosphoglycerate. Bisphospho means I have two phosphate groups on this three carbon uh, molecule. Also, I'll call this a three carbon substrate. And look what's coming along here. ADP, adenosine diphosphate. That is our discharged, our dead battery. A dead battery. Luckily, it's rechargeable. 
dead battery. And this, and let's look at this, uh, what we see, uh, our, our, this squiggle bond right here. See that squiggle? That means it is a very high energy bond. It is very, uh, it is not a stable bond. What ADP can do is sort of like just if you're under an apple tree and you want to go pick an apple off the tree is literally plucks the phosphate off this three carbon substrate to become ATP and whatever is left over uh, on this three carbon substrate. But let's look net at what we've done. ADP plus phosphate uh, to ATP. ADP to ATP. We formed an ATP. And remember, this reaction is happening in parallel with another one. So really, we've formed or we've, we've produced two ATP in this one step. Let's, uh, if we recap, let's look, uh, because this is going to be important, the method in which we have our ATP, or rather, I'm sorry, our ADP and our phosphate becoming ATP. This is a phosphorylation event. ADP phosph is phosphorylated by this phosphate group up here. And that phosphate group is, uh, is perched on a three carbon substrate, we're gonna be calling this. So there's a name for this type of phosphorylation, which we will uh, talk about uh, uh, momentarily. Uh, and that is known as substrate level phosphorylation. Substrate level phosphorylation, because ADP to ATP is a phosphorylation event. ADP must pick up a phosphate to become ATP, fair enough. But where does it get that phosphate from? This is where we call it substrate level phosphorylation because ADP picks up the phosphate from a three carbon substrate, thus substrate level phosphorylation. Okay, so we have, we've made two ATP so far. Um, and our 3-phosphoglycerate here now has to render itself somewhat such that it can, uh, it can, it can uh, uh, position itself rather to give up this last phosphate which, uh, which is connected to it. So let's see how that happens. We go through a series of mutations, of isomerizations. Uh, if, you, if we look here now, uh, this, uh, the first step in this process is taking a phosphate and moving it to the next oxygen up. It doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but indeed that does, that does occur going from here to here. It is a necessary step. What class of enzymes might carry that out? Well, that would be an isomerase class of enzymes because we're creating, going from our starting material to our product, a constitutional isomer. So phosphoglycerate mutase, that enzyme must be belong to the class of isomerase enzymes. Fair enough. So we have our two phosphoglycerate now, and we go through uh, another enzyme mediated reaction in which ultimately we lose water from this. So we have HOH uh, with a single bond here, and it becomes a double bond. Now, uh, that is essentially the reverse reaction of what a lyase class of enzymes does, and thus uh, would be considered a lyase class of enzymes that mediates this reaction. But let's look at what happens. See this nice straight covalent bond here over on the left? By uh, forming that double bond there, that, uh, we get what is uh, what, what, that squiggle. Now that squiggle right there means a very uh, unstable, very weak and very high energy bond connected to that phosphate. And thus what ultimately happens is that phosphate then becomes very, just as before, very labile. And labile means it's very easy to pluck off. And let's see the final step in this uh, the second five reactions of, uh, of glycolysis. Well, shockingly, here comes another uh, dead uh, rechargeable battery, ADP, coming along, and it sees this nice, juicy, very labile phosphate just sitting there on this three-carbon substrate, and it reaches up and plucks it off. ADP plus phosphate becomes ATP. 
So we formed another ATP. Again, remember, in parallel, there's another uh, of these series of reactions happening. Uh, we're not showing it, but it is indeed uh, happening right along parallel with it. And, uh, and, and we form, again, by way of substrate level phosphorylation, this ADP uh, removes a phosphate from this three carbon substrate to form ATP. Now, if we did uh, the, the very simple math, in this second five reactions of glycolysis, we produced four ATP. With those four, we'd have to pay back the original two ATP that we spent in the energy investment stage, and we have a net of two ATP per one molecule of glucose. And the end result now is we, we've taken glucose and we've catabolized it to two three-carbon fragments of pyruvate. Looking a little closer at this substrate level phosphorylation, remember these are all enzyme mediated reactions and here is a uh, 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 so it's just sort of a generalized view of it. Here is our the enzyme which carries out this phosphorylation. Remember the class of that enzyme? A kinase enzyme because it mediates phosphorylation events and in this case we have our uh, this is the final step of glycolysis that tenth reaction uh, here where we have that substrate and uh, its phosphate connect connected to it given as that P in a circle and here is ADP uh, again written suggestively right here that phosphate is then attached to ADP to form ATP uh, uh, and, and that product, again, uh, of pyruvate through substrate level phosphorylation. Our phosphorylated three carbon fragment uh, acts as a platform or a substrate, that's where that term comes from, to phosphorylate ADP to become ATP. Now, importantly, uh, there are, uh, we call this substrate level phosphorylation because we're going to be looking at, in the next unit of study, another type of ATP production, which is also a phosphorylation event, uh, but it is not from uh, the, this ADP does not pick up its phosphate from a substrate. It picks up a free phosphate through another process, a different type of process, and of course it has a different type of name. So I'd like to look a little closer at glycolysis, and uh, the, the upshot of glycolysis is it is energy. Uh, energy bearing. We, we does indeed produce some ATP energy. However, we have some uh, problems with glycolysis uh, by, uh, given look, looked at uh, all alone. We know that glycolysis, in order to produce those two ATP per glucose molecule, yields two pyruvate molecules and two NADH molecules. We cycle uh, two NAD molecules to NADH. Problems that can arise from that. Uh, the first is that we're continuing to uh, go from glucose, we're destroying glucose and building up pyruvate uh, within, within our cells. Now, if that cellular pyruvate concentration becomes too high, that can, become, that can be a toxic event. So it really with anything at too high of a level, too high of a concentration within cells can be toxic. And through glycolysis, that pyruvate is building uh, is building up and there seems to this garbage that's building up there doesn't seem to be any way to shuttle it away the other problem with glycolysis is that uh, in order for glycolysis to continue nad is constantly being used up to form nadh so we need to somehow replenish our nad supply so glycolysis continue can continue in tandem with, uh, with finding a way to bring down that high pyruvate concentration within the cell. Now, there is no uh, way of doing this which, which, uh, which is absolute. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is there's no cyclic way of doing, uh, of doing this uh, in, in a sustainable fashion. Uh, we're going to see how there's other processes which, which link up with glycolysis, which help out with this. However, uh, uh, through glycolysis alone, uh, we cannot continue to do this. However, 
we are able to provide a pressure release on this, if you will, a temporary process which uh, allows for pyruvate to be converted to something else so its uh, concentration goes down and we uh, have a way of of cycling used NADH back to NAD. And we'll talk about that uh, right now. The, these, this process is known as a fermentation. Fermentation processes uh, essentially just allow glycolysis to continue for a time, not indefinitely, but a time longer. What they do is they act in a, in a very temporary fashion to reduce cellular pyruvate concentrations and at the same time cycle or oxidize that NADH back to NAD. And there are two uh, types of pathways for these fermentations. There is a lactate fermentation, which is by far the most common type of fermentation. And then there's another a concurrent one known as alcohol fermentation, which while in the minority is still bears importance. And we will take, uh, so we'll take a look at that uh, as well. So let's look at lactate fermentation. I call this uh, fermentations in general a pressure release, um, and this is, uh, I, I should mention that fermentations are only required during strenuous exercise. Strenuous exercise, such as sprinting uh, as, as long and as far as you can, uh, such that uh, any other energy production pathways, which, uh, which are perhaps more efficient, uh, the, are, are not allowed to, to come into play. The oxygen, those oxygen or those aerobic processes, which we'll be looking at in the next section, uh, are, not, uh, are not able to compensate because the bottleneck is getting oxygen to the cells so that that, uh, more, uh, that, that, that more energy uh, intensive process or energy extensive process can occur. So it's only what we're talking about now is a special case and it's only when in animal systems under strenuous exercises like sprinting for a long way, not jogging, not going for a run, but sprinting absolutely as fast as you can. So it is under these processes where glycolysis is the major energy producing pathway because it does not require molecular oxygen, which is now limited by the bottleneck of its delivery to the cells. Uh, but only, uh, so only glycolysis is what, uh, what can continue. Uh, in, in these strenuous exercises. So these are where these fermentations come into play. We uh, quickly outstrip the ability of glycolysis to provide ATP energy under these conditions. So in a last uh, ditch, uh, desperate uh, uh, sort of uh, event in which we need to prolong glycolysis, we use lactate fermentation. Um, it allows for the regeneration of NAD, so glycolysis can continue, and it temporarily converts lactate, or rather pyruvate, into lactate. And here down here, we see, uh, we see this process. Here is pyruvate, and that is getting built up to, uh, to, to toxic uh, concentrations within our cell. We have to convert that to something else so that its concentration can then come down. Now, what that's converted to is lactate. Lactate. Now notice, uh, we'll, we'll talk about the structural difference uh, in just a moment, but again, it should be obvious that as pyruvate concentration is coming down, lactate concentration is now increasing perhaps to toxic levels. So this is why this is not a, uh, this process cannot continue. It is not sustainable. But let's look uh, uh, from a, an organic chemistry standpoint, an organic structural standpoint, what are we doing going from pyruvate to lactate? What are our structural differences here? Well, immediately what I see is we are taking our, our we have a carbonyl here on pyruvate, which is converted or reduced to an alcohol on lactate. So we've gone from uh, we've lost CO bonds and gained CH bonds. So that is by definition a reduction. Fair enough. We know we can't have a reduction without a concomitant oxidation right alongside of it. And again, and what we have here now is NADH is oxidized 
to NAD. So we make lemonade out of lemons, if you will. Uh, so that allows our NAD stocks to go up so that glycolysis can continue. And it allows pyruvate to be converted to something else temporarily so that its concentrations can go down. And the lactate concentrations that we find are going to go up so that this, uh, uh, this process is, uh, is not ultimately sustainable, but at least it does allow a pr prolongation of the process. Our second fermentation pathway, albeit a minor one compared to the uh, lactate fermentation, is known as alcohol fermentation. Alcohol fermentation is uh, another pressure release pathway, which we said before, we're re regenerating NAD from NADH, and we're going to convert that pyruvate to something else. In this case, uh, what ultimately happens is our three carbon pyruvate, notice one, two, three carbons in here, loses one of those carbons as carbon dioxide, CO2. That one carbon, two oxygens, and CO2 comes from a carboxylate group. A carboxylate contains one carbon and two oxygens, as does CO2. Let's look at the enzyme which mediates that. Oh, shockingly, it is a decarboxylase uh, uh, type, you know, so again, in the name that gives some clue as to its function. Pyruvate gives a clue or a, a statement as to its preferred substrate. Decarboxylate gives it its, uh, its uh, actual, uh, its actual uh, uh, task within there. So if we're losing one of our three carbons in pyruvate with this carbon dioxide molecule being blown off, we must form a two carbon molecule. In this case, it's known as acetaldehyde. And that preps us for this process. We've already, uh, we've already converted pyruvate to uh, something else. So pyruvate concentrations are now decreasing. Acetaldehyde is then converted to ethanol. And let's see if we can identify what type of uh, a process this is. Again, I see a carbonyl on the reactant side and an alcohol on the product side. Thus, that is a this process is a reduction, so we must have a, uh, a subsequent oxidation along with it. Again, we're making lemonade out of lemons because the oxidation involved allows us to take our NADH and cycle it back to NAD so that this process, the glycolysis process, can continue. At the beginning of the next lecture, we're going to uh, start talking about uh, problems uh, with this and find out why fermentations are, are not sustainable, but rather only a temporary fix of the problems involved in glycolysis.